because music has such an interesting impact in human emotions, right? It has a unique way、uh, to connect with, with our soul. It has no cultural borders. Excited to have Amy Lee, the founder of Dance for Healing, with me today. I know、yeah. that our listeners are going to want to learn a lot about you, so I thought it would be great to just start a little bit from the beginning. You know, tell us a little bit about your background. I told folks that you know you're known to your community as someone who survived cancer and made a big pivot. You started Dance for Healing, which is amazing. But even in your childhood, you were a bit of a performer. I heard. All I know is that you were you you were you won some speech competitions, talent competitions. You were quite outspoken as a young lady. So maybe you could tell us a little bit、yeah. about your background. Yeah, I'm so glad that you remember that. That was so funny. So my mom tells a funny story、um, that my aunt emphasized multiple times that when my mom took me to visit my grandma in the countryside, and this is an old Chinese courtyard house.、Um, And she went to took a nap. You know, Chinese people do do this typical siesta thing. And of course, I was a child that I don't need a nap. I was maybe I'll say I was probably like three or four maybe at the time.、Um, and then I saw a group of adults were doing chores、um, in this open space. I just went up and introduced myself and start dancing and singing for them. <laughs> yeah, and so. My mom woke up, thought, "Okay, it's time to introduce her daughter, you know, to everyone." And everybody just looked at me and smiled and said, "Yeah, we already know." <laughs> yeah, so you can see, like, I'm a little rebelly,、uh, you know,、um, child that just simply have a huge passion for creative art to really speak to my soul.、Um, and then you're right; I won a public speaking contest when、mm-hmm. I was twelve, and I was putting on stage a lot, you know, because.、Mm-hmm. You know, just back at the old times, most girls that tend to be more shy when they find one is not. <laughs> they just keep putting me on stage, so I will be reading poems, you、wow. know,、uh, tell jokes, dancing、wow. on the stage. Now,、yeah. but then, but then you went to university. You were at UCLA, I believe, or Cal State. You studied、yeah. uh, graphic yeah. design, branding,、yeah. and marketing, and it sounds like you pursued that for a while before things changed. Yeah. So one thing I. Quite grateful for you know moving to the U.S. as an immigrant is actually this reconnection back to the creative arts,、uh, because technically in China I was studying taxation management,、um, and then you know obviously that's <laughs> very different.、Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then especially U.S. tax and Chinese tax is completely different. So when I came to the U.S., I pretty much restarted my school, right, and then. I was、uh, in a community college、uh, where I had a really good counselor,、um, and actually, the reason I even find out about graphic design is that、uh, a friend told me that, oh, you know, since you like to draw, you know,、mm-hmm. maybe try this thing called computer graphics. So I was like, oh wait, you mean I can draw on this computer? I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. And so I took、uh, life drawing, two D design, three D design.、Mm-hmm. Painting, you know, basic drawing, everything, right? I was lucky enough to、uh, study like an independent study with one of my professor has interactive、uh, design,、mm-hmm. and so that's what actually eventually got me in the job at Yahoo.、Um, you know,、uh, after I graduated. Wow, wow, and that's so obviously your background in technology is now so important because. <laughs> Dance for Healing is a technology-based solution, so、yes. so that is amazing. So obviously, you were on a career path. You were in a big tech company in California. What could be wrong? And then things changed at some point for you. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So I was at one point、uh, at the time I was an art director at Yahoo. Then I was、uh, an user experience manager at AT and T. And then after that, I was in a different agency, which working with more. Fashions, lifestyle brands, and so I was at a point that I think I make too much money for large corporations, and I always had a heart for social impact projects. And then I saw literally a random post、um, might have been from Women Two Point Zero saying, "Oh, Singularity University is offering scholarship to women entrepreneurs." 
And I was like, scholarship, women entrepreneur. And those <laughs> highlighted yeah. words that come up in my head. I was like, oh, that seems interesting. Let me just try to apply. Then I got accepted. I got offered a full scholarship. And that's what moves me to, to the Bay Area uh, study in NASA. But my mom literally say, moving to NASA saved my life because I actually had a wrong diagnosis in LA, um, you know, two of the best hospitals. And then the fact that I moved to the Bay Area that enabled a correct cancer diagnosis. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about sort of what happened. You were, you were very ill. You had to go through extensive treatment and recovery. Shortly after I left my job, I got very sick. Um, and then I didn't know what it is. Um, and I was wrongly diagnosed because I had like eye drooping uh in uh double vision very mm -hmm. severe double vision mm -hmm. um and then i was almost not going to nasa because you know i was very sick but then at one point i have some acupuncture had sort of kind of temporary relief um and i was feeling slightly better and i have this conversation i still remember today that i was talking to my mom and then my mom's like well you know what if you get sick you move to the bay area and I was like, well, but I don't want to miss this opportunity, you know, if, you know, like, think, you know, because, you know, what if I'm, I'm you know, I'm not going to be happy, like missing it, right? Uh, but luckily, I did go because I was actually prescribed wrong medication. Um, because I was wrongly diagnosed with myasthenia guavis. Myasthenia mm -hmm. uh, guavis, as you know, uh, you know, can have similar symptom, right? Like eye drooping, double mm -hmm. vision. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there was one encounter, literally, I was in this close distance talking to the neuromuscular doctor, mm -hmm. and I told him I have facial numbness. And he looked at me eye to eye. He said, that's not my stima guavis, and mm -hmm. they still went ahead and diagnosed And then I remember uh, my ENT doctor, who's the one who diagnosed me, tell me, um, you know, this is, um, you know, like, rely on your community. Like, this is too big to carry yourself and wow. I think that really resonated with me and then when I went back um, one of my uh, classmates who volunteered to try me he uh, he kind of while I was getting my medication he kind of like called their school uh, and then the school director leadership director literally waiting outside the classroom you know as soon as I arrived and then she was like are you are you comfortable sh we share with your classmates? You know, mm -hmm. we want to respect your privacy, but we also want to support you. And then that was the first time I was like, I think this is too big for me to carry myself. Just go ahead and share. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and 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 I don't and I'm I'm not asking you to you know reveal too much detail. It yeah. sounds like it was a very tough year or two years. Yeah. And then essentially you you got resolution, right? I mean, you had some resolution. And then, and then your life was changed. You decided to take a different tact. What ended up happening? Did you sort of just go right back to work and say that I had cancer, I'm done. I want to go back to work or did, or was it a different thing thought for you? Yeah, right? uh, definitely. So what's interesting when I got to NASA, uh, Singularity University is supposed to be a program that helps uh, social entrepreneur. And then, so I was um, very interested in stress. Uh, because my own experience, if I look back, you know, like I can do a lot of uh, stress situation, like, you know, relationship, work, you know, had a very abusive boss at one point, have a lot of international clients. So I got very interested in stress. I was researching about stress and then it was clear, like occasional stress was good, get your things done. But if you stress for, a, you know, like a chronic period of time, that it could completely break your body down. And I think some of the data that I look at was six months of stress could break your body down. Okay. Um, yeah, and in my case was cancer and other people could be different disease that they ended up have, right? Um, and so my initial project in, in Singular University was like, how do I help people detect stress in mm -hmm. an intrusive way? So we were mm -hmm. literally thinking about putting now nano biosensor to detect stress into Jewish. And then we sort of stuck, it's like, well, if I can detect stress, but what do I do? I can't say, Mark, you stressed. You're not gonna react too well, right? <laughs> yeah, so, and then we run into a musician, the musician, so, oh, why don't you play music for them? I was like, 
guitar that totally makes sense you know what I'm saying because <laughs> like I love music you know like when I was going through my chemo and radiation yes. you know like on the day I couldn't get out of the bed I would listen to music you know when I'm nervous I listen to music you know mm-hmm. like all these like it was like the integrate you know integrated part of my healing journey right and and so our initial version of idea in NASA we actually won a standing ovation and makes a lot of my classmates and professor cry. <laughs> yeah, because I literally talk about our idea about stress management using biosensor music. And at the end, I said, I might be the first user for this. And then the faculty, the classmate, everybody knows. And at the end, when I share like, I will be the first user for this. And everybody's crying. Like they, they, they send me the video afterwards and then the photographer, the videographer was so good, went over the room and I was just like, they don't watch it. I was like, wow, people are literally in tears. So connect the dots, connect the dots for us. How did, how did that get from there to here? I had to pretty much put a project on hold mm-hmm. um, and I can do like a whole year of pretty intense treatment. Mm-hmm. And during those treatment on the day I feel slightly better, I was doing a lot of research, reading up about stress, reading about different biosignal to track stress. Mm-hmm. Um, also learning the health benefit of music, you know, um, and a couple of months after I finished my cancer treatment, I was at Stanford Fox Behavior Conference, um, and it's called Design for Dance. When I was at the conference, I met different range of speakers that both, you know, people who started like a high school dance school and that went on to become a land profit, or, you know, like uh, doctors at Kaiser, you know, talk about how benefits, you know, so like a huge range of group of people that I was like, oh, wow, I never realized DNS has so much benefits, uh, you know, and there's so much clinical study behind it, you know, and that was eye-opening for me. And so a couple uh, weeks later, I was at the hackathon and I just went to the judge and said, I have this idea, what do you think, you know, and what do you think about this name, you know, and he was like, yeah, sounds good, go ahead and do it. And that's when we started to like, yeah, I literally built a prototype. Uh, you know, luckily I have extensive innovation product development background and I have- Right, everything really, you told us uh, about, it all came to fruition. Exactly, right. Then we eventually launched this program. I mean, when did you launch the program? So the first one was 2014 in spring. And I, and even now looking back, I have no clue how I managed to do that with zero funding. I just go around and talk to people. <laughs> If people got excited about my idea, I share with them. I have about, I think for a two year program, I have probably about 40 volunteers. Okay. And I was building a tech company like a land profit. <laughs> I was very adamant that not letting people uh, pay for it because, you know, as a patient, I understand the financial challenges, you know, the productivity lost, and I didn't want them to pay. You know, at the same time, you know, I also later learned that I need to figure out how to make it sustainable too, right? Yeah, so definitely a lot of these entrepreneurial journey of up and down, yes. Yeah. So tell us about the the launch. You were, who did you do the program for? Were, were you, it was obviously live back then, right? Not everybody yes. was doing Zoom. So, yeah, where, where, so where were you? Who were the patients and, um, yeah, and how did it so, go? Yeah, so we have, uh, the first program is for cancer patients. In fact, the first program we started with breast cancer patients. Wow. And then we got invited to be part of the Stanford Cancer Support Care Program. And the director right. said, we open to all cancer patients. Are you okay with that? So cool. sure. Yeah. So that's when we open up to all cancer patients. Um, the program is a com- combo, both in person plus online. And then from a patient experience, we have a launch party. Everybody come in. We do a lot of fun improv bonding exercise. Uh, and we make it really fun, like playful. And then we would do like a, a, a lot play exercise where you put like a little paper play in the back. And then, and then uh, we would have people mingle around, talk to each other, and then they will write something nice about that person and put it in the paper play. <laughs> and then we started doing more like fear circle where we would have people come into the middle of circle sharing something Mm-hmm. they're concerned about and then the people in the circle can walk in and in however the distance they want mm-hmm. to the person based on how strong they feel uh the similar concerns 
So if you really feel strong, you can go up and get a person a hug. If you're slightly strong, you can go a little closer. If you don't, you stay where you are. And I have to say that exercise bring up a lot of tears uh, sure. because yeah, like we have cancer patients sharing. I don't know if I can see my kids growing up, you know, and it's, it's really a, a, you know, a concern among others. And what's beautiful about the fear circle is it allows people to feel they're not alone, right? Because sometimes sure. we tend to feel like, why am I so afraid of this? Or why am I so worried about this? Like, is there something wrong with me? Or like, they don't necessarily feel comfortable to share, right? But by having this kind of such a supportive environment, mm -hmm. you know, like, like people feel like, oh, I'm not alone. These are very simple ones, but we can do a lot of thinking, you know, to like think about, you know, in terms of human psychology, how it works, you know, how- Because you, you haven't gotten, because they're not dancing yet. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You're yeah. working. You're working up to dancing, and then you're gonna. Then you're gonna bring dancing in. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So for the launch party, um, we have a very clear communication when they sign up for the program. Uh, there's a preference survey. They will fill it out, so we get to know what kind of music and dance they like. Is there any health concern that we should know? Uh, we also um, very clearly communicate. This is a buddy program. You're gonna have a buddy. Go ahead, expl do, expl explain that. What does that mean? A buddy program? Yeah. So our platform uh, is based on Fox behavior model. Uh, you know, Fox is the person that I told you that I went to his conference. Mm -hmm. And so in Fox behavior model is kind of like this, you know, this is motivation. This is ability. So mm -hmm. this side ability, and then you have a curve mm -hmm. and this is um, prompt. He used to call it trigger, but now he called it prompt. And for any behavior to happen, you have to be, you know, have enough motivation, Motivated. Have, you know, have actual ability, able to do it. But most of the time, people can have the motivation, have the ability, they sit the whole day and do nothing. Right. Lack of effective behavior prompt. And research has shown uh, that if you're in a team, you're more likely to accomplish your goal sure. and you really excel when you have a kind of a buddy. And that's where their buddy comes in. Yeah. So we, we, a lot of our foundation designs based on Fox model, in addition to my own uh, years of background in human centered design behavior strategy. So the, the launch party and the closing party at the end, mm -hmm. uh, so the launch party usually is longer. Uh, we even do like a, a, like a potluck. That's when we bring the educator in. So at the beginning, uh, we usually invite either an oncologist, a doctor or physical therapist or occupational therapist, you know, come in to kind of talk about, you know, like why they think this this program would benefit, mm -hmm. you know, uh, different conditions in the program, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. So there's a little bit of education usually. Uh, yes. Then each week from a patient experience is they come to the launch party, they find uh -huh. a buddy, uh -huh. and then every Saturday they come into an in-person class. And then Wednesday there's an online class. Okay. And then by next week, then they went on to a new classes and then same thing repeating. Yeah. Well, that's wow. for eight weeks. And wow. in there's a closing party. Yeah. You're starting to turn from not only cancer patients to yeah. now looking at people with memory loss and dementia. Tell our audience sort of what the study is going to do. What are we going to do? So the first part will be really looking into our current platform is this working for dementia patients. Uh, mm -hmm. I do have extensive user experience background. So it'll be like research interviews with these mm -hmm. uh, patients and families, you know, with the three person pair uh, to like learn what works for them, what's not. Um, and then we're probably likely going to adopt, you know, some of these uh, measurements, like, you know, allow them to maybe rate based on certain keywords so we can understand, like, you know, what are some of the desired features and also really understand their behavior, their needs and wants and fears. Mm -hmm. uh, so how we can make sure the platform tailored to their needs. And we're likely gonna go into this, um, you know, probably a couple of months of iteration to make sure the platform is updated based on their feedbacks. And then still go back to them and then testing with the initial group again. Yep. Uh, and then likely in between that, it's probably gonna be a very agile process where there's constantly back and forth asking feedbacks. And then, uh, then once these first set of group of people 
verify that this is working, we're likely probably going to expand to a slightly bigger group. Um, and then, then we also, during this whole time, we also wanted to start getting people start wearing the fitness watch and right. testing, you know, like the behavior of wearing a fitness watch. Is that working? What kind of protocol we need to add in to allow the caregiver able to be a supporter of the fitness watch as well as the intergenerational buddies? Uh, and then maybe technology component, we got to figure it out. Can people use the computer at home? How does their, uh, you know, how does their uh, a camera works, you know, allow them yes. to be able to remotely see each other? Yes. How does the sound works? Is the music able to flow beautifully in their house? You know, like some of these things, definitely technology-wise, we got to figure it out in details. Then we can start this a week program, you know, where we're, we were track all the different data we were talking about, like both the platform data, the fitness watch data, yeah. uh, the uh, survey data, which is the self-report data, yeah. uh, you know, preference data. And so now you've you've woven the caregivers into the buddy system a little bit. Am I right? Yeah. So um, the intergenerational program, it's mm -hmm. going to be a three pair, like, you know, meaning that three person in a pair um, with their patients. Mm -hmm. eventual patients, care partners. Uh, care partner adopted that term from Dalalas Thompson. Uh, okay. She was very adamant, don't call him as a caregiver, call him as a care partner, as a partner. Okay. <laughs> um, and then the intergenerational buddies. In a, in a perfect world, what are you hoping the platform will give and bring to people with dementia and their care partners? Yeah, um, I like to describe it as like, imagine precision medicine for creative arts. Because music has such an interesting impact in human emotions, right? It has a unique way uh, of, to connect with, with our soul and has no cultural borders. Right? I like that. One of the things that's made the music programs for dementia so successful is the ones that are the most successful connect the preferences of the listener, whether it's something from their childhood or the right era of music or something yeah. they used to play. So do you do the same thing? Do you try to match people to sort of the kinds of dance that they like to do? Yeah, so that's, you absolutely on point. Um, it's more than that as well, uh, because uh, there is definitely that cultural point. So like say, for example, we have a lot of immigrants in this country, right? So in Iranian women who have dementia, if you play certain type of music and dance, from you know the culture that she's grown up, she's more likely to, you know, immediate engage with it. Yeah, so the culture one is definitely one one area. There's also interesting factors is that personality is another one very interesting because it not only can uh, contribute to the com compatibility of the body. There's also interesting study have indicating uh, there's correlations between personality in the type of exercise works better for them. Huh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> a quick example would be like, say, for example, a more mathematic, uh, you know, you know, sort of uh, physics type of person might enjoy more structural kind of exercise. Okay. Uh, a creative type person you know, like myself might enjoy more free form kind of, kind of exercise or dance, right? And so that's also another thing that could be really interesting. Yeah. Is that what you found in the original uh, work that you did for several years with cancer patients that you really yeah. have to mix and match the, the dance with the personality? Yes, we definitely have uh, that in, you know, uh, obviously out now 20 pages pattern, we including a lot of these details. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, it's always harder to like having all these components actually on nail down. We actually do a lot of hand matching. <laughs> Like, you know, really looking, but we did gather all that data, yes. Huh. Like, yeah, the preference, what kind of music and dance, what kind of cultural preference. We even look into hobbies and interests, how do you connect with people? That's why I say it's like eHarmony for help buddies, right? Literally, like, yeah. it's almost like a dating app, except you're not like, you know, dating in a sense, you know, you're like having someone who's compatible to you, yeah. I like you know, <laughs> you're, you're, it's all, the, you're putting the user experience and the patient-centered design together to meet their needs, really. And, and yeah. people with dementia need, and their caregivers and their care partners, yes. they need outlets for creativity. They need to be inspired. Um, right, right. Yeah. And they, they're also looking for social connections too. 
you know, whether, whether that social connection is with a high school girlfriend, it could be potentially, you know, like looking for companions too, right? It could be really like, we're not promoting dating, but we're promoting human connections, right? If that human connection turned into another life partnership, great, you know? I mean, this, there's a lot of people that really get to know each other in a very authentic way, right? So it could create some romantic partnerships, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. I mean, I, um, I'm gonna let you go. And I think Dance for Healing is a tremendous, tremendous addition to the creative arts for people with dementia. You know, mm -hmm. there's music and art. You listed a whole bunch of things that, that, that resonate with people inside their bodies, inside their minds, mm -hmm. and then to help their care partners. And uh, mm -hmm. the more, the better. So um, thanks for joining yeah. us today and talking with me.